Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to thank the organizers of this seminar for inviting me to give this, uh, uh, to make this presentation today. It's really a pleasure. And I'm always proud when I'm associated with ICGB because um, they have played a significant role in my career advancement. For today's seminar, I would like to present on the title, Cryptic Zika Virus Infection Unmasked from Suspected Malaria Cases in Northeastern Nigeria. For those who are interested, this um, uh, website, you can get to this link. That's where the full article is so that you can get the detail because I will just uh, scrape it by giving you just the important aspect of it. So the details, you can get it from this link. I'll do it for the... It's not going... Let's see. All right, I'll go into introduction. Uh, I will say that Zika virus is a re-emerging virus infection that was first isolated in 19, um, let me say, it was first, uh, first isolated 19, I think 1947 from the rhesus monkey in Zika forest of Uganda from Aedes Africanus, and then in human in 1952. 19, uh, Zika is a flavivirus. It has a positive sense genome and belongs to the genus flavivirus of the family Flaviviridae. It is primarily transmitted by Aedes, uh, Aedes, Aedes, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus. Although some other rules of transmission have been reported to include sexual perinatal and blood uh, blood transfusion routes, epidemics, the history of epidemic of um, uh, um, uh, epidemics caused by Zika virus in human uh, in, nine, in two, between two thousand and Seven and 2008, uh, there was an uh, epidemic, or let me say epidemic was reported in Ireland of Yap, and another name for it is Micronesia, Gabon, and Senegal. Then it stopped, and another major epidemic occurred in French Polynesia in 2013. This major epidemic was also accompanied by another one that occurred in New Caledonia in an Easter Island in 2014. The, this pandemic exploded at the end of 2014, affecting about 26 other countries by March 2016. It includes other countries, include Brazil, Brazil, Colombia, and Cape Verde. In Brazil, about 1.5 million cases were suspected. In Colombia, greater than 25,000. In Cape Verde, greater than 7,000. But in, at the end of 2016, over 2,000 cases of Zika-associated genital syndrome were reported in 22 countries and territories in the Americas. And, and uh, then you, we had, uh, we had uh, cases like over 5,000 suspected cases and over 175 confirmed cases in 48 countries and territories uh, in 20, by the end of 2016. Wait, go back, go back. In Nigeria, the first case was reported in 1954, then again 1975, 1983, 2016, the latest was 2020. Permit me to tell you that Nigeria is one of the 32 countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa that accounts for 93% of malaria death. So malaria and arboviruses are co-circulating. 
Zika virus infection mimics malaria at the prodromal level. So differentiating Zika virus or arbovirus infection from malaria at the prodromal phase clinically is almost an impossible case. So, so that makes uh, Zika virus to continue to circulate uninterrupted and has the tendency to spill over to global outbreaks. What, is, what was the objective of the study? The objectives include one, to investigate the silent circulation of Zika virus among malaria suspected patients. Number two was to estimate its burden in three northeastern states in Nigeria. Number three, to actually determine its current status in Nigeria. Materials, under materials and monitor, permit me to tell you briefly about uh, Nigeria. This study was conducted in northeastern Nigeria. Northeastern Nigeria comprises six states, but out of the six states, three were so chosen for this study, randomly selected for this study. Generally, Nigeria covers um, uh, square meters of over 9,000. Uh, 9, and has a projected population of over 2 million in 2022. Then the collection sites were, like I said, three states out of six were randomly selected. So they are all teaching hospitals. One was based in Adamawa State, and another one was based in Bauchi State, and another one, the last one, was based in Borono State. This was how we, we used the formula to make sure that we got the right uh, sample size. In fact, after the calculation, we got the 384. Therefore, we decided to make it 496 so that we have good representation of the population. I'm sorry, I'm having... I'm trying to change the slide, what you say? Mm -hmm. So, and the uh, diagnostic method we use, we use qualitative Zika IgM, and we use it to perform uh, this, uh, to test the samples from Adamawa and Borono State. And the, the source of the kit was my source uh, from USA. Well, we also use uh, qualitative Zika IgG ELISA. And we use it for only Borono, Borono samples. I know many questions will be asked. Why didn't you use the same for all? I will answer you too at the end of the study if the questions are asked anyway. Then number three, we use plaque reduction neutralization test for all the samples in Adamawa, Bauchi, and Borono. And the target was using malaria uh, suspected cases, those that visited the selected hospitals for malaria tests were selected for this study. Then what was the result? The result was really fantastic, in my own opinion. Then only, I will say that, uh, let me say, only 2% of the patient with Zika IgM also had neutralizing, neutralizing antibody indicating recent infection. But 8.5% of the IgM negative also had neutralizing antibody indicating past Zika infection. Then 9.4% of the IgG positive also had Zika neutralizing antibody indicating past infections. Then 13.5% had both IgM and IgG with the, that is the possibility of secondary in a Zika infection. Overall, Zika infections and the three states were not significantly different. However, no, the overall Zika infection the three, and the three states were significantly uh, different with, part, with particular interest in Bauchi. So, and the, according to the odd um, ratio, Bauchi state residents are approximately four times more likely to acquire Zika virus infections. 
I know I will be asked the question, how do you know? Because cross-reaction also takes place with PRNT. I will tell you that, yes, I agree to some extent, but when high theta, endpoint theta is used, like what we use was 90% uh, to 100% neutralization. And then look at the theta. Nine samples had a theta of 128. 16 had a theta of one in one in 164. And 13, one in 32. 11, one in 16. Eight, only 18 were, had the least one in eight. Such high theta are highly suggestive of Zika. And again, judging from the guidelines from um, a CDC updated guideline on Zika diagnosis. The, the according to that guideline, if IgM is also able to neutralize uh, the uh, neutralize the infectivity of the virus of Zika virus at greater than one in ten theta is a possibility of recent infection. So with that guidelines, I can boldly say that yes, this. Uh, these results are valid. Uh, we, to, to kind of assess the cross reactivity of Zika virus neutralizing antibody with other viruses. You may observe that I did not really use IgM to analyze other variables, no. Because, because of the cross, the broad cross reactivity among the flavor viruses, I did not use IgM. I only use IgM and the ability of the IgM or IgG to neutralize as a mark of um, Zika infection. So I tried to also check the cross reactivity of Zika virus antibodies uh, with other arboviruses that are endemic in Nigeria. Then from my from from this study, I discovered that, or let me say, we we observed that thirteen point eight percent did not cross react with other arboviruses tested, while eighty six point eighty six percent cross reacted at varying degrees, like sixty point seven percent of uh, of the Zika positive uh, 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 sera also. Uh, cross-reacted or was they were positive for dengue, while 23 were positive for West Nile and 7.1% seven were, posi were positive for yellow fever. Then we discovered also that 39.3% also co-infected with chikungunya virus. That was a, another uh, very, very interesting finding that there was this cross-reaction. And according to that CDC updated guidelines, anyone that has data more than 10, greater than one in 10, in this one, all these other arboviruses, they, they, they had more a data of more than one in 10 to show that there may not actually be cross-reaction, but actually co-infection because all these viruses, many reports have shown that they are endemic in Nigeria. Uh, according to age distribution, there was no significant uh, uh, association between the age and the Zika virus infection. Next one, next one. Again, there was no significant association between the gender and the virus, the Zika virus infection. But I want to say something. Under gender distribution, although there was no significant association, but we discovered that females of childbearing age, 16% of, of such had uh, Zika neutralizing antibody indicating the infection. And overall, gender, we know gender did not significantly associate with Zika, but the presence of Zika virus in, uh, in females of childbearing age is of great concern because of the, 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 the known uh, Zika congenital syndrome. 
this is uh, we tried to also check uh, the, if there was any association between Zika virus infection and uh, the, uh, the places of settlement that is rural or urban. But we discovered that um, there were no there, there was no significant uh, difference between the rural, urban dwellers and Zika infections. We tried to, to find out because the, the samples, the sample collection and the interval of onset is very important to guide what diagnostic method do you have. Generally, arboviruses, including Zika, has transient viremia. So using PCR, you have to know when did you collect samples and when did uh, onset of symptoms start that would guide so i just decided to or let me say not me the group the investigators we decided to check the relationship between zika virus uh, infection detection when samples were collected one to seven days after onset of symptoms or when samples were collected uh, seven to ten days we discovered there was no significant difference in my opinion might be wider interval is required for, for it to really give us a good insight as to the good I mean, intervals to use when collecting samples and which method do we use to test these samples to obtain the desired uh, goal. We tried to check and um, we discovered that some of the patients we tested actually received uh, anti-malaria and antibiotics. Please, I want to enlighten us on something. In Nigeria, once somebody has uh, acute febrile illness, they don't go to the hospital. They don't seek medical attention. They will just take anti buy anti-malaria from the nearby uh, uh, patent medicine store that is close to many, uh, many, many settlements. So they don't need to go. It's only when the symptom persists for up to one week. And then they will start going to the hospital to confirm whether it's malaria or not. And when they go to the hospital for, for checkup, the, best, the first thing the hospital will do is to rule out malaria because malaria is really endemic. That's when we discover that because we used the question, a questionnaire to collect this information, asking the patient, did you try to treat yourself with anti-malaria and antibiotics before you came to the hospital? Um, those who admitted that, yes, they received treatment uh, were about 59%, let me say roughly 60% uh, accepted. Those who did not receive treatment at all before we collected the samples was about 38%. And then we discovered that there was a significant association between Zika infection and those who received antibiotics. I will come back to it during discussion. We also check those who received yellow, because we know uh, yellow fever and Zika, they belong to the same family. So we also check those who received uh, yellow fever vaccination and those who did not receive yellow fever vaccination. And we discovered that 74% did not receive any uh, yellow fever vaccination. And in a country where you have periodic yellow fever uh, epidemics, then you understand that though there is safe and um, available uh, um, Yellow fever vaccine, many people are not still taking it. And if they don't take it, how will they be protected? It explains why the periodic yellow fever outbreak persists in, the, in Nigeria, despite the availability of the safe, uh, safe vaccine. Then we discovered that, we discovered that 15% of the people who received vaccine, a yellow fever vaccination actually had the, the, the Zika virus infection, while 11 who did not receive also, no, not that was IgM. 7% of those who received the vaccination had uh, Zika virus, while 15 who did not receive vaccination had uh, Zika virus infection.
All right. Um, we. Overall, we discovered that 26.4% of the patients tested received yellow fever vaccination in the three states. Like I said, I, I prefer more on um, uh, neutralizing antibody than IgM. Only 13.8% of the unvaccinated as against 15.3% of the, of the, no, let me repeat this. 13.8% of the vaccinated as against 15.3% of the unvaccinated actually had Zika virus infection. And overall, Zika virus infection and yellow fever vaccination status uh, was significantly associated. On that discussion, I will start by saying that from our study, we discovered that malaria has been falsely accused. Malaria parasite has been falsely accused, falsely diagnosed, and falsely managed. Because in this study, this population, this study population, were malaria suspected. And all of them, we were able to detect both acute and past Zika infection among malaria suspected cases. And this finding underscores the importance of screening malaria suspected cases for adboviruses. But permit me to say something that the concept of recent and past infections of Zika virus infection is, is confounded by, is, is confounded because about uh, Zika IgM, for instance, has been detected in about um, detected for 12 months or 12 to 19 months in patients. So can you now say it is recent because IgM is able to neutralize the virus is difficult, but we still believe that as long as IgM is able to neutralize up to 90 or 100 percent is likely to be recent. But how recent is it? It is is another issue. Uh, it's an it's a study for another time. Then we also discovered, we said, high theta neutralizing antibody of one in 64, one in 28 cannot just be by chance, cannot be co-infection, but actually possible, highly suggestive Zika infection. But another thing is we know there is co-infection between other flaviviruses or other arboviruses. But the, in the midst of co-infection, it's difficult to say which virus occurred first because of the concept of original antigenic sin, which says that the antibody to this first virus before the second is always higher. Then we discovered that 13.8% of those people in fact, we tested had monotypic Zika virus infection. We suspect they are, they are possible monotypic because they did not cross react with any of the viruses, uh, other viruses we tested like dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, and chikungunya. While 86% um, cross reacted with, with these viruses. And um, another thing I want to say is that in on that discussion, that Zika virus infection was significantly higher in, in Bauchi than Boronu and was least in Adamawa. The question is why? I want to say that the three states differ in terms of climatic, vegetation, which impact on vector competence and transmission. Let me say Boronu state, for instance, has is a combination of Sudan and Sahel savanna vegetation. While um, uh, Adamawa State is, I think, um, is, I can't remember the exact um, uh, the vegetation, is different. And then another factor I want to think, I'm not very sure, but I want to think that may also contribute to the difference is genetic differences in the vectors, genetic differences in the host. And then another thing that I know differ in these three states. Waste management, environmental sanit sanitation, all these factors we know impact on vector competence and transmission. And that may act 
actually explain why there is significant difference in the three states. And um, I want to say that Edis aegypti, Edis albopictus, which are principal vectors of, um, of Zika viruses, they transmit Zika, they transmit yellow fever, they transmit um, um, dengue. So a, a one vector can transmit four arboviruses in during a bite. And with this particular characteristic, it gives them epidemiological synergy. It gives them seasonality, seasonality synergy and also attack rates. So co-infection impact adversely on the management of this disease individually. It's very difficult to manage co-infections. No, get back. No, go back. Yeah, this, no, go back. Uh, we have mentioned it and the implication of female bearing age having Zika infection. It can result in stillbirth and other neurological disorders of newborn. So this finding necessitates the need for active surveillance, especially in females in childbearing age. We said that uh, from our findings, Zika was not associated with age, gender, occupation, and interval between time, time of symptoms, onset, and sample collection. But Zika was Zika virus prevalence was significantly associated with those with uh, antibiotic stroke anti-malaria treatment. And this observation made us to dig further to read more literature. And we, in, we discovered a report that says that ivermectin, erythromycin, tetracycline, and uh, mef mefloquine, yeah, no, let me say if, if vermentine, erythromycin, and tetracycline, and then some anti-malaria like mefloquine and chlorophyll have been reported to, if, to effectively treat or inhibit virus many virus infections, including yellow fever and Zika. So we came to that um, speculation that it could be that the frequent use of these antibiotics and anti-malaria may be the reason why we don't really have epidemic of, um, of Zika virus infections in Nigeria. It's a speculation, please. It's yet to be confirmed. And then we also said that yellow fever vaccination status had significant association with Zika virus infection. And we said this because the low population immunity against yellow fever virus, as evidenced by 73.5% of patients who did not receive yellow fever vaccine, explains its epidemics in epidemics, periodic epidemics in Nigeria. Uh, we in in the in our in our discussion, we advocated that yellow fever can serve as a good alternative for Zika virus vaccine. The, que the question is why? And I want to explain why we speculated that. Like in Brazil, it was discovered that a significant Zika virus related microcephaly was observed in, north, in the northeastern region of Brazil where yellow fever vaccination coverage was the lowest. Secondly, it has been reported that there was a strong protection of yellow fever vaccine against Zika virus in mice. Then thirdly, another report shows that when Zika virus, uh, chimeric, when chimeric Zika virus vaccine was developed using um, uh, yellow fever, 17D yellow fever vaccine as the backbone, it gave a significant immune response. And then fourthly, for us in this study to discover that more unvaccinated 
uh, uh, patient with yellow fever vaccination, those who did not receive the vaccine had Zika infection. These are the factors that make us speculate that yellow fever vaccine may serve as a good alternative while we are waiting for a, a, a good candidate Zika virus vaccine. In conclusion, we can say the cryptic Zika virus infection underscore the need for differential diagnosis of malaria suspected fever patient for arboviruses, especially the Zika virus. And we also said that the absence of systemic surveillance for the virus is worrisome in Nigeria because of its association with neurological disorders in newborn. And finally, I would say the co-infection with other arboviruses may impact adversely on the management of these diseases individually. Next slide. I was also told to say something about my research journey. You can see this girl trying, I don't know whether it's a girl or a man, trying to climb the rope. Somebody looking at this may say, ah, what is it there in the rope? It's very easy, let me climb. But try it, you will know how difficult it is. That was how I found my research journey. I joined academics in 1992 as lecturer too. To ascend along the ladder was cumbersome, rough and devastating. No mentorship, no encouragement from any uncle, from any source. And in the 90s in Nigeria, no facility for anything called virology. And my dream was to specialize, major progress in virology. For me to even get a PhD, it was frustrating and discouraging. I spent about eight good years of frustration looking for reagents, looking for facilities for me to conduct my research. It was almost it's like a task that is difficult, that was difficult to achieve. Till 20, 2003, 2004, I was, I was, I was blessed with a, a one year sandwich fellowship uh, by OW, Organization of Women in Science in, development, in developing countries. I was blessed with that fellowship to go to Senegal to complete my PhD research project. That was like um, a blessing, a miracle for me. I had to walk from 7 a.m. sometimes till 12 midnight to make sure that I, will, I, I could produce results that will quali qualify me for PhD in Nigeria. So the finding of that my PhD research opened my eyes to the reality of the vilification of malaria parasites, while the main culprits called arboviruses like Zika, Dengue, yellow fever, and the rest were circulating unperturbed, causing havoc to human health. How do I go further in raising awareness? I need more research findings to raise awareness because up till today, there is no active surveillance for arboviruses in the country. And my dream is to make sure that this happens. Then ICG became on board and bailed me out by hosting me in Tracy for nine months. That was when I developed black assay. I was trained and taught by Professor Marshall to develop black assay for arboviruses. So I came back. At the end of it, we published, uh, 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 published the work, and that work really announced the co-infection of malaria parasite and also co-infection of different arboviruses. It was an eye-opener. So from there, that experience endeared me to Professor Marshando. Since then, that was since 2009, up till tomorrow, and I believe it's forever. So the next one I received, the CRP grant from ICGB in 2016 to establish the Diagnostic Laboratory for Arboviruses in Medugri. If you come to Medugri now, you can see, you, you will see that ICGB provided 
the basic thing we needed to start this project. And we can conveniently handle agroviruses here in Medugri because of the support we received from ICGB. I said the grant was very small, but very useful to generate sufficient data that has boosted research report on arboviruses in Nigeria. The ICGEB in collaboration with NEP funded another project on COVID-19. And we continue, in fact, the project continues. We finished that paper on nasopharynges using lamp, and we also try to use saliva for lamp. Lamp is a new, a new diagnostic kit that will not just be useful uh, for reference laboratories in the cities, but very, very useful in the community laboratories because LAM has a uniqueness and it's still PCR-based. It, it detects acute infection, but so simple, simple in methodology, simple in, 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 in results, interpretation and analysis. Well, I'm not here for LAM, so I'm just, because we are still going to do more work now on uh, funded by WHO, no, not WHO, I'm sorry, funded by ICGEB in collaboration with NEP and the Bill Gates Foundation. And the title of that project ongoing is Expandia and is purely on arboviruses. So presently my dream on arbovirus diagnostics in Africa is being fulfilled courtesy of ICGB through this, this project, the new project called Expandia. I want to thank the organizers and all the audience, everyone that is listening, that has listened to me, I want to thank you for the privilege and the opportunity uh, for me to make this talk, make this presentation today. I want to thank the co-investigators. The co I want to thank the WHO Polio Lab staff. I want to thank the WHO for giving us the facility to carry out this, uh, uh, this work and we continue to work uh, on arboviruses. So Lara and Claudia, please, thank you very much. I want to thank God Almighty for the privilege and the opportunity and the wisdom, everything. He is, he is the reason for my existence, for who I am, what I am, and what I will, I, I, I will ever be. Thank you very much.